he went to his home. This is God's word. You may be seated. Thank you, Debbie, for reading our scripture. Thank you again to Mitzi Brown, Elaine Curtis, Maggie Curtis, and Rex Curtis for all the work putting the Christmas decorations together. And um, hopefully you can see, too, that some of the work we've been doing here in the sanctuary has uh, been progressing, and most of that should be completed this week, and we'll have all the AV uh, installed before next Sunday. So excited um, about getting to, to live into this space together during the Advent season. Um, this is the first Sunday in the season of Advent, and uh, we are kicking off our Advent teaching series uh, with this encounter that Zechariah has with uh, an angel. And I can say um, that uh, I have never personally had an encounter with an angel. Maybe some of you uh, have a story of that, but uh, maybe you've noticed that the Christmas story is full of angels. Um, We sing about them, we read about them, maybe some of you have been dressed up as one of them in a a Christmas pageant, and um, there's a lot of angels in the Christmas story. Um, But for me, at least, uh, most of my thinking uh, about angels hasn't been so much shaped by the Christmas story or by the Bible, at least initially my thinking about angels was Uh, informed more by one of my favorite movies as a kid. It was about a group of angels who were trying to help the baseball team with their namesake to win the pennant. Anybody remember that Angels in the Outfield movie? That was one of my favorites. Maybe others of you like to watch Christmas movies at this time of year, and if so, maybe you go back to the old classic, It's a Wonderful Life. And Do you remember the line that the little girl says to her daddy in that movie? She says, Daddy, teacher says that every time a bell rings, an angel gets its wings. Now, I'm not really sure about that theology, but um, that's at least the view in the movie, right? That when people die, they turn into angels, and in order to get their wings, they have to do some good deed. And so Clarence is trying to help George Bailey so he can get his wings. Uh, So maybe our thinking about angels has been shaped a little bit more by Hollywood than by the Christmas story. And yet I would wager that the issue for most of us is not so much that we have this faulty thinking about angels, but more likely that we just don't really think about angels at all. Angels don't come to my mind very often. Maybe they don't often come to yours. We don't really think about these unseen creatures, and that's not really very surprising. Um, given the fact that that we live in what philosophers would call the secular age. But we live really in the first culture in the history of the world that has largely dismissed the idea of the unseen, largely dismissed the idea of the spiritual, the first culture that really believes that this life that we can physically see is really all that there is. Matter is all that matters. And so whether you're a Christian or you're not a Christian, you probably don't often think of these unseen creatures called angels. Our view of our universe is more as if we are alone, uh, drifting in this empty sea, and here we are on planet Earth sort of hanging in this vast, empty universe alone. And, And even if we believe in God, God is largely distant, and it's up to us to really be in control of this physical world. Uh, Mike Cosper is a name that maybe some of you know if you listen to that podcast, The Rise and Fall of Mars Hill. Mike Cosper hosted and produced that podcast. He also wrote a great book that I read this year, um, a book called Recapturing the Wonder. Recapturing the Wonder, Transcendent Faith in a Disenchanted World. He says, when you're a kid... When you're a kid, you might be apt to imagine all sorts of unseen creatures. If you think about fairies or goblins or monsters, even angels, but he says we're taught in our culture today, when you grow up, when you become an adult, the way that an adult thinks is that you only believe in the things that you can see, that you can hear, that you can test, that you can measure, that you can subject to the scientific method. Those are the only things that are real. And so therefore, Mike Cosper says, our universe, our world has become disenchanted. It's been emptied of its mystery. 
It's been emptied of its wonder. It certainly is not a world that is teeming with angels. But then you come to the Christmas story, and even maybe uncomfortably so, it's full of angels. There are angels everywhere in the Christmas story. Jesus speaks regularly of angels in the Gospels. It's a world that's far more enchanted than you and I often assume. And so what we're going to do in this Advent season is we're going to look at these uh, four encounters that people have with angels. Zechariah, Mary, Joseph, the shepherds. We're going to look at these encounters with angels in the hope that we will be freed, we will be liberated from this disenchanted view of reality. The hope that that we will be brought out of this this disenchanted view that frankly is very anemic, that is starved for the supernatural, that is starved for the spiritual realm, the realm of things that are unseen. Any of you noticed how many movies Hollywood seems to be making about superheroes? Have you thought about why that would be? Why are there so many movies, like the whole Marvel series or all the Superman movies? Why are there people who literally obsess about these sort of Hollywood fantasy worlds, be it Star Wars or Harry Potter or the Lord of the Rings or all the new kind of Greek mythology movies, the Percy Jackson series? Why is it that people so long to almost enter themselves into these worlds, to live in these fantasy realities? Why is that so popular in spite of the fact that we live in this secular age? And I think the answer to that, the answer even to why the Disney movies are so popular, the reason why people are enamored with these stories is because they speak to this longing within every human heart to connect with the reality that there is more to this world than we can see. We long for the supernatural. We long for a world where there is such a thing as good and evil and where good triumphs over evil in the end. We long for a world where we're able to have some connection, some conversation even with uh, unseen beings like angels. We long for a world where we are part of a story that is bigger than what meets the eye, where there are forces, there are plans at work beyond what we can observe and what we can see. We long for that. And we long for it because we were made in the image of God. We were made for a relationship with God. What does Augustine say? He says that our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. We were created for that connection with the supernatural. Now, don't get me wrong. In saying that we were built for this world that is more than what we can see, I don't mean to suggest that we want to live in fantasy land, that we want to just live in this world of the make-believe, that we're unconcerned with this real physical world, the world of reason and facts and observation. Far from it. Actually, one of the things that I love about Luke's gospel Right before the passage that Debbie read for us this morning, the way Luke writes his gospel is this. He says, I'm a doctor. I set out to carefully investigate all of the reports of what happened in the life and the ministry of Jesus. He says, I've gone to the eyewitnesses. I've interviewed them. I've talked with them, and I've carefully compiled this account together. And if you read Luke's gospel, you'll notice that he's constantly referring to specific names, specific places, specific times. If you were creating a fable, a myth, to try to hoodwink people, you would not give those details. You'd want to keep your options open, keep it very general and vague. But he pins himself down specifically. Because he wants his readers to know, look, I've talked to the eyewitnesses. Most of them are still alive. You can go talk to them. Fact check me if you don't believe me. The extraordinary supernatural events of the Christmas story, we believe, took place in this real physical world of of facts and observation. And our faith is rooted in reason. And yet, and yet we believe that there is more to this world than we can see. And part of why I want us to to enter into this series, even to think about these encounters with angels, is to invite us again into a re-enchanted world. That part of the purpose of the Advent season 
is to help us to be able to approach the story of Christmas again with a fresh sense of awe and wonder and worship. But you know, more than that, more than that, we need this enchanted view of reality. If we are going to cope with all of the pain and the suffering that you and I face within this world. I read a book recently um, by uh, an author named Tish Harrison Warren. She's an Anglican priest. Uh, She wrote a great book called Prayer in the Night. And don't go out and buy it. We're actually going to give it to everybody on Christmas Eve as a a Christmas gift this year. So if you can wait a few weeks. It's a really good read, though. And and it's a book about um, how do we deal with the mystery of suffering? Suffering often is mysterious to us. We don't understand why God allows the pain and the challenges and the hurt that he does in each of our lives. And she writes about how how do we face that as Christians and, and, and listen to what she says. I thought this was really profound. She says, unless you embrace an enchanted cosmos, a world of mystery." where there is more than meets the eye, where God is working out purposes beyond what you can see and understand, you will never be able to come to terms with so much of the mystery of your own life and your tangled questions that do not find answers. She says to endure the mystery of suffering is to learn to surf the teeming waves of wonder. And if there ever was a couple who were familiar with the mystery of suffering, silent suffering in their case, it was Elizabeth and Zechariah. Luke tells us that they were faithful, devoted people. Verse 6 says that they were, they were blameless, that they, they loved God. They were faithful in their devotion to God. Elizabeth was the daughter of a priest. Zechariah was a priest. These were people who were very devoted in their relationship to God, which must have made it all the harder, all the more difficult, what Luke tells us in verse 7, that in spite of their devotion to God, they had no child. Because, Luke says, Elizabeth was barren and both were advanced in years. And you know, that phrase, advanced in years, to be, to be considered old age in Bible times was to be over the age of 60. They didn't know that 60 is like the new 40. So for those of you who, you know, you're, you're still living, going, going strong, maybe over 60. But in those days, lifespans were shorter. And so they were, they were advanced in years. And they were unable to have the child that they had longed for. And some of you are familiar with that form of suffering as well. That longing, that desire. Maybe some of you tried for years to have a child. Maybe eventually you were able to do so. Others of you, maybe you're in that place where you were unable to have that child, or you are longing to be able to have a child, and in that suffering, in that waiting, all of those questions arise of of why God? Why God, when there are so many children who don't have parents who are able to care for them? Why when there are so many children who don't have parents who care for them well? Why would you not allow us to be parents? We would be good parents. We'd be great parents. Why wouldn't you give us a child to love? Some of you are familiar with that pain that Zechariah and Elizabeth knew very well for themselves. And you know, along with that pain of of not having the child that they longed for, they also had the stigma. Because you know, in that culture in those days, when you didn't have a child, the culture looked at you and assumed that there must be some way that God was displeased with you if he wasn't giving you that child. And so just think about this for Elizabeth. Not only was there the pain of not having that child, but there was this this false guilt. They must have done something wrong, that God was somehow displeased with them. So here are Zechariah and Elizabeth, and they are living under a dark cloud over their home. And along with that, there's also a dark cloud over their world. You know, Luke tells us in verse 5, he says that they lived in the days of Herod, king of Judea. Maybe you've heard of, of Herod before. He's known to history as Herod the Great. 
Um, but he was not great in his character. He was only great in his building projects. In terms of his character, he was a tyrant. He was cruel. He was a very um, anxious, fearful, suspicious person. The saying was that, that around Herod, no woman's honor was safe, no man's life was secure. Maybe you remember the story when he heard that maybe a new king had been born in Bethlehem and he couldn't find that king. What did he do? He had all of the boy babies under the age of two put to death. They're living under the rule of this incredibly cruel leader. Luke says in verse 5, the, the days of Herod, king of Judea. And by the way, when we read that, when we hear in the days of Herod, king of Judea, we might just sort of move quickly past that. But for Luke to say that they were living under Herod's rule was as if Luke was saying in the darkest and most evil days that anyone could remember, these events took place. In the darkest and most evil days anyone could remember, these events took place. If I had a dollar for every time that a Christian has come to me over the last several years and has said, don't you think that the world is in a terrible place? Don't you think that we are living in the end times? Don't you think that things really couldn't get much worse than they are in the world or in our culture or in our country right now? I would be a very rich man. Many people have come with that perspective. Sometimes they even give me books. Um, I'm not opposed to receiving books, um, but I, and I try, to, try to read them. Um, I'm reading actually one right now uh, that somebody gave to me, said, you gotta read this. And and, and the book makes a case for, for why our culture, why our country is in a particularly um, terrible place uh, right now. And surely there is some truth to that. But can I tell you the reason why I struggle um, to, to really um, accept that hypothesis that the world is sort of in its darkest place, to really buy into that kind of doom and gloom perspective is because the assumption behind so much of that, that way of thinking seems to be that God is somehow now no longer on his throne. That God is no longer at work, that he no longer is working out his good and redemptive plans and purposes for this world. And yet right here in this story, in the darkest and most evil days that anyone could remember, God was preparing for Christmas. God was getting ready to turn the lights on in a way that nobody could have seen, in a way that was mysterious, in a way that wasn't visible, God was nevertheless very much at work. He was getting ready to do something remarkable. And so even as this cloud hangs over Zechariah and Elizabeth's family, even as this dark cloud hangs over their world, something remarkable is about to take place. Well, what is that? We're told that Zechariah goes to the temple to perform his duties. That's not remarkable because he was a priest. But what is remarkable is the fact that he was chosen by lot to be the priest who would go in to offer up the incense in the inner court. Josephus, the historian, says there were like 20,000 Jewish priests in those days. The incense was offered only twice a day. So you can do the math on the odds of being chosen. I'm not going to try to do the math, but you can do the math on that. I'll just tell you it was unlikely. It might only happen once, maybe twice in your lifetime if you were a priest to be chosen to get to go and offer up the incense. So this was huge for Zechariah. This is his big moment. This is probably something he's looked forward to throughout his life. He goes into the temple. He goes into the inner courts. He's about to offer the incense, and what happens? is he sees an angel. An angel appears to Zechariah. And in that moment, what is Zechariah's response? And I got on Amazon this week, and I looked to see if there have been many books written about angels. Um, spoiler alert, there have. There's like 2,500 books on angels on Amazon. The best-selling book is by um, a lady. I haven't read this book. I don't recommend it. I looked at the reviews, though, and apparently one of the things that she says is she says, you know you've had an encounter with an angel because when you encounter the angel, you are flooded with this sense of deep serenity and peace. I don't know where she's getting her sources, but I don't think she's getting that from uh, at least the biblical encounters with angels because when Zechariah sees this angel, what does he say? 
Does he say, hey, thank you so much for being here. What an honor. This is my big moment. It means so much to me that you would show up to witness me offering the incense here in the temple. No. He's terrified. Luke says he was troubled when he saw him. Fear fell upon him. If anything, seeing the angel didn't flood him with serenity and peace. It only increased the fear that he might have already been feeling. You know, those fears of, is God displeased with us because he hasn't given us a child? The fear of, who's going to care for us in our old age if we don't have a child? The fear of, is our family line just going to end here? Are we going to miss out on the joy of getting to care for a baby in this life and all the fears that would come from living under the rule of the Romans, living under the tyrannical rule of King Herod? If anything, seeing the angel did not decrease his fears. It only compounded, it only increased the fear that he might have already been feeling. And yet, what does the angel say to Zechariah? Well, he says the same thing to Zechariah that angels tend to say to people in most places. He says, fear not. Fear not. It's a message that God gives not only through angels and prophets, but that he speaks himself to his people time and time again in the scriptures. It's a message apparently that God's people need to hear over and over again. The angel says, fear not. But why? Why should Zechariah not be afraid? Why should we not be afraid? He gives a couple of reasons. Here's the first. The angel says, Zechariah, don't be afraid. Why? For your prayer has been heard. God has heard your prayer, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. He says, don't be afraid because God has heard your prayer. And in that moment, what was Zechariah thinking? Maybe he was thinking, what prayer? Maybe it had been so long since they had even prayed that prayer for a child. After all, they are now advanced in years. You put yourself in Zechariah and Elizabeth's shoes. You think back to the beginning of their marriage when they're struggling to conceive a baby. Maybe then they're praying, God, please, would you give us this child? They pray that prayer for years, and yet eventually, maybe they stop praying. Maybe it seems no longer like a prayer worth praying. I mean, isn't that kind of Zechariah's reaction to the angel when he says, how could this be? After all, I'm old and my wife is advanced in years. By the way, that's pretty good diplomacy, isn't it? I'm old, but she's just advanced uh, in years. There's a guy who's got some real marriage experience. But he's cynical. He doesn't believe it. Maybe it's a prayer that they had stopped praying, and over the years, the questions had begun to compound. Does God even hear our prayers? Does he even care? Is he even listening? And the cynicism begins to grow. Maybe that prayer began to feel very hopeless for them. And what does the angel say? He says, Zechariah, your prayer has been heard. You were wondering, was God listening? Does God really care? Yes, he does. He has heard your prayer. He's going to give you this child that you have longed for, but he's going to do it in a way that's going to demonstrate that God is able to do the impossible. Your prayer has been heard. And one of the things I think that maybe this story can teach us is that even though it may feel sometimes as if our prayers have been rejected, It may just be that God's answer is delayed. We can't assume that our prayer has been rejected when really God's answer maybe has just been delayed. Maybe some of you are here today and you've got what feel like hopeless prayers. You've been praying for somebody that you love to come to faith in Jesus. You long for that for them. Praying for healing in some way, praying for a relationship to be reconciled, praying for a spouse, praying for a child. These are good prayers and yet they haven't been answered, at least not yet. I think the reminder for us from this story is we, we, we can't assume that our prayer has been rejected when maybe God's answer is just delayed. But there's a saying that's popular within African-American churches, a saying that probably arose because of the experience of so many people that, that were living through waiting and oppression and injustice. The saying goes like this, God may not come 
when you want him, but he's always right on time. God may not come when you want him, but he's always right on time. Some of us have the life experience to look back and to see that God's timing was better than ours to prayers that we have prayed. We've seen his wisdom and the way that he's answered those prayers in his timetable. And yet sometimes, sometimes those prayers aren't answered. Sometimes we haven't yet gotten to see the answer to those prayers. And maybe that prayer is still going to be answered in the way that we desire. Maybe not. And yet even if it's not, even if it's not, God still has a message for us that can still our fears. A message for us that can still our fears. Look what the angel says to Zechariah. He says, yes, Zechariah, you're going to have this baby boy that you have prayed for, that you have longed for. You will have joy and gladness. Many will rejoice at his birth. And it's that second phrase, many will rejoice at his birth, that I think is significant here because what the angel is saying is, yeah, you're going to be really excited. You get to have the baby that you've prayed for, but God is up to something so much bigger than just fulfilling your prayers and desires. Many are going to rejoice over the birth of this baby because of what this baby's birth means. He's going to be the forerunner. He's going to go before the Messiah to prepare the way for God's Savior who is going to come into this world. Why is that significant? Here's why it's significant. Because the, the message that Zechariah most needs, that's able to speak to his deepest fears. Indeed, the way that God is able to comfort and calm our deepest fears is with this great news of a bigger story of redemption, of what God is up to in this world. This is an invitation for our world to once again be enchanted. That God is up to something so much bigger than any one of us, but yet which can include every single one of us. The angel is announcing this, this good news of, of God's story of redemption and how God is going to rescue and redeem his world. Now, the title for our Advent series is The Story That Stills Our Fears. And you see, John the Baptist himself, he understood this story. The baby that was promised to Zechariah and Elizabeth, he would grow up to be a great man. The angel says that. He says he will be great before the Lord. Jesus said John was the greatest prophet in the history of all of Israel, and yet John was not consumed with his own greatness. He wasn't preoccupied with his own desires and ambitions and dreams for his life. He was able to live an incredibly fearless life. John the Baptist was one of the most fearless people who ever lived in the way he stood up to power, in the way he preached convicting messages, in the way that he was not concerned with what other people thought about him. Why? Because he knew he was a part of a much bigger story of redemption. He knew that his most important role in life was to point others not to himself, but to Jesus. He knew that was his ministry. And, and, and what John understood about this big story of God's redemption, the angels understand as well. You know, in Ephesians chapter 4, Paul says that the thing that angels care about most, you know what angels care about the most? The thing that angels long to look into more than anything else, Paul says, is the story of God's redemption, his plan of redemption. They long to look into the gospel. That's what they care about. The angels are enamored with God's plan of salvation. If you read through the Bible, have you ever noticed it's not as if angels are constantly visiting people in the Bible, is it? It actually happens fairly rarely that people get to see and encounter an angel. It tends to happen at these key junctures in, in God's saving purposes. And so when you get to the life of Jesus, it's like angels are everywhere. Because they know that Jesus is God's plan of salvation. The angels, they're there to announce his birth. They're there to encourage him in the wilderness when he's been tempted by Satan. The angels are there to strengthen him in the Garden of Gethsemane before he goes to the cross. They are there at his resurrection. They are there at his ascension. And they will be there when he comes back to renew all things. He will come with all his holy angels. We're told Michael, the archangel, will sound the trumpet to announce Jesus' return. 
The angels are all over the events of our salvation because that's what they care about the most. You, you might even think that, that the angels, as it were, are, 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 are able to see with blinding clarity the urgency and the importance of the gospel story. I think it's almost as if the angels, they hang with bated breath every time that a sermon is preached, every time that the gospel is shared, longing that people would receive it, that they would believe it, that they would have the courage and the clarity to live in light of it and to share it with others. But Jesus says there's more rejoicing by the angels in heaven over one sinner who repents. That's what the angels long to see. That's what, what they understand. That's what John understood. You know, what does Gabriel say about John's ministry? He says he's going to make ready a people prepared. Prepared for what? Prepared to receive Jesus as their Messiah. Prepared to see the depth of their sin. Prepared to see the beauty of their Savior. A people who recognize that God's greatest answer to our fears is found in the person and the work of Jesus. That's the evidence that God cares about us, that he hears our prayers, that he loves us, that he is at work even when we do not see how. And in many ways, what the season of Advent is all about, as John said earlier, it's about preparing our hearts, making ready a people prepared, a people who are able to once again wonder and worship this Jesus and what he has done for us. People who are able to find our joy not primarily in our circumstances, but to find that joy in being caught up again in the wonder of being part of this great story of God's redemption. No matter what dark clouds hang over our lives right now, people who are able to trust that God's in control, that he's sovereign, that he's working out his purposes even in ways that we do not see. And you know, Zechariah doesn't seem to get that right away, does he? Might have noticed, he says to the angel, right, this this can't be. There's no way that this could happen. There's no way that my wife Elizabeth could have a baby. And how does the angel respond to that? He hits the mute button, right? (laughs) Zechariah gets muted for nine months. He can't say anything because he disbelieved the message that the angel had brought to him. But, you know, if you read a little bit further in Luke's uh, gospel, chapter 1, we get to Mary. An angel comes to Mary. We'll look at that next Sunday. The angel says, Mary, though you're a virgin, you're going to conceive and give birth to a child. What does Mary say? She says, how can this be? Right? She asks questions. She has doubts. Mary gets blessed. Zechariah gets muted, but Mary gets blessed. What's going on with that? I mean, did Zechariah just get a grumpy angel? Was the angel having a bad day? The answer is no. But what we recognize, and we'll unpack this more next Sunday, is that there are different ways to express doubts and questions. Right? There are questions that really want answers, and there are questions that don't. There are questions that come from an open mind, and there are questions that come from a closed mind. Mary says, how can this be? Zechariah says, this can't be. He's cynical. I can't believe there's no way God could do this. There's no way God could bring good out of this. God invites our doubts. He invites our questions. There is so much mystery in each of our lives, so much that we do not understand about how God is working. But what Mary sees and what Zechariah eventually sees and what you and I are meant to see is this recognition that even when we don't see how God is working, he is still at work for our good. He's a God who can do the impossible. If he could create this universe out of nothing, that if he could give Elizabeth this child in her old age, that if he could give a baby to Mary, though she's a virgin, if he could bring Jesus into the world to take on our flesh and raise him from the dead and forgive all of our sins and adopt us as his children, if Jesus is coming back to make all things new, can't we trust That this is a God who is able to work out his purposes for our good, even when we don't see what he's doing. And that's the invitation in this season of Advent, is to once again live in a universe that is enchanted. To believe that God is at work in ways that you and I cannot see. And so let's pray as we come to the Lord's table this morning.
Father, so much of our lives are shrouded in mystery. Now, maybe rarely do we recognize and see what you are doing. God, if we were left only to look at our circumstances in this world, we might conclude that the bad outweighs the good. We might not be led to the conclusion that you are a God who loves us and who hears our prayers and who cares for us. But we thank you as we come to this table this morning. You have given us the very best comfort that can overcome our fears that you don't love us. You've given us the best evidence that you are a God who truly cares for us, who loves us, who is working all things for our good, and that is the life-giving sacrifice of your son Jesus for us. We thank you that we get to be reminded of that this morning in a tangible way as we see his body broken for us, his blood shed for us. Lord, would you persuade our hearts again today that you can be trusted, that you are good, that you love us. Remind us that Jesus hasn't just done this for us in the past, but he's united his very life to ours so that we can experience this communion with him here today. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Friends, on the night that our Lord Jesus was betrayed, he gathered with his disciples.